don't know what it is. Okay, welcome back. I am Alan Lugner Waitkus, and this is American Literature 1865 to Present. And let me go ahead and apologize in advance. I'm sure tonight's video is probably going to be longer than normal, but I've got some sort of explaining to do, even though not that much explaining has to do, <laughs> believe it or not, with the, the story itself. Um, of course, we are covering um, Susan Glaspell's Trifles, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. First, I want to address a couple of things, I, what I call the English teacher ironies. And some of them kind of overlap, and there's these things that I've noticed in 20 years of teaching that uh, I've written down for, so I'm, I'm looking slightly below the cameras at those. Uh, the more I like something, the harder it is to teach. So the the more I like a book, Salman Rushdie's my favorite novelist, and, and then I tried to teach him, and it was a disaster. It's, so usually it's the things I don't like that I'm better at, uh, that are easier to teach. Uh, the more I like something, the more students hate it. That's, that's the second one, which is true. Uh, Annie Dillard is probably one of my favorite authors that we'll read, and I know in Comp 1, certainly, uh, students uh, reject uh, her for some reason. I, I write as off as they don't get it, but <laughs> it could just be uh, me. Uh, number three, the worse I do teaching something, the more students uh, like and get it. And that's true. With the, I always do a Vonnegut novel every semester and rotate in chronological order. And I've discovered that the ones, the novels that uh, I kind of felt I was flailing on and wasn't doing a good job teaching, students really liked it and seemed to get it when I thought I was nailing it. Uh, students were bored, senseless, and you know, liked the book. So uh, anyway, there's that. And then there's the last one, which kind of sounds insulting, and it's, it's not. It's the more students and I pick up on things quickly, the less I like it as an instructor, uh, which is kind of a, you know how you've got those friends who are snobs who have to watch the serious movies nobody else understands and only they get them, and that's not what I'm saying so much. Uh, the example I have li listed here is uh, Good Will Hunting, the movie, which I've never seen. I, I didn't see it anyway because I don't really uh, care for Matt Damon or Ben Affleck or, and I know that's how it's not really pronounced, I'm just making fun of him. Or, um, ugh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, I'm not a huge Robin Williams fan. And years later, reading a student's essay, reviewing it, I discovered that his name was Will Hunting in the movie. Ugh, I had never noticed that the title wasn't Good Will Hunting, it was Good Will Hunting. And that just seemed so lame to me that I just, it's like picking up on play on words for dummies. I know, y'all probably love the movie. It could be great. I've never seen it. Don't send me messages telling me to see it. Uh, anyway, because I'm not going to watch it. So let's, let's get to uh, Susan Glaspell's um, Trifles. And there's a couple of things here, too, I noticed. And I just now noticed after teaching this for, this is only about my fourth year, about my, including summers. What's that? Four times five, Twelve semesters. So I've tw taught this 12 times now. Um... I, it's the first time I really realized that the, the way this class is set up, if you haven't noticed, it's short sto stories, poetry, uh, and we go in chronological order as far as short stories in chronological order. With, well, the poetry and short stories are kind of mixed in together, sorry. Then we go into the nonfiction, the two essays, and then we do the plays, uh, the play, Streetcar Named Desire, and then we end with a novel. So while it's chronological, I try to keep sort of, you know, play, novel, shorter fiction and poetry together. And this is a play, and for some reason it showed up in the middle. But because it's a short play, I think that's why I've never really noticed that I was doing things out of order. And in fact, uh, Susan Gla uh, Glaspell turned it two years after, two or three years after uh, it first was performed. She actually wrote a short story called A Jury of Her Peers uh, that's based, basically it's a short story version of this this play exactly as, as things happen. The um, the reason I bring up that whole play issue is that we really haven't discussed, before we do Tennessee Williams's Streetcar Named Desire, we'll discuss some things that you have to consider when reading a play, 
versus when reading a short story or a novel or an essay or a poem. And one of the big things that I have to really stress here that I made the mistake of when I was in college was I would sort of think, well, I can speed up reading this by just skipping over the uh, stage uh, directions. And again, big mistake there. Uh, it's the case with this play, and especially when we get to Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire, because Williams was so very specific on how he wanted, uh, you know, all of the stage directions and all of that other kind of stuff. So if you, you're you really remiss uh, if you don't read the stage directions and you'll really miss out on some other things. Another thing too, I, I don't think, we noticed, noted a little bit with the other two, and I guess it's come up in other stuff, but it's really important here is the setting. And, and as far as setting, remember setting means two things, time and place. The, the location here is not as important as the time. This was written again in 1916. Now remember that is four years before the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. I'm going to wait a second. Ask yourself, what was the 19th Amendment to the Constitution? That was the one that gave women the right to vote in 1920, uh, which followed, oddly enough, a lot of people don't know this, and I don't know what this has to do with a constitutional history class, but the 15th Amendment, which gave African Americans the right to vote was 50 years before, and a lot of people don't really realize that. They think that, of course, African woman, American woman, women couldn't vote, but and that was all part of Reconstruction, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I'm not a history teacher, so I'm not going to insult you. Um, so let's, let's get into the play, and I've got the characters listed here that I'll keep looking back at. I'm, I'm pretty terrible with multiple characters, and you're going to think, there aren't that many characters in this play, but I still manage to confuse names, and I'm still pretty proud of myself last week for... I think that's the first time I've ever made it through the other two without getting one of the ex-husbands confused. And I may have. I don't. I didn't really watch the video after I'm finished because I don't. You know how that is. Watching yourself on video. All right. So let's get into the story. Of course, a murder has happened. We never see Mrs. Wright, who's the wife, whom, who rather clearly murdered her husband. Uh, and so what they're trying to do, and, and, and really pretty much everyone in the room knows that, whether they're going to say it or not. They, they know that she murdered him, but the question is, can they you know, prove it? It's kind of like Casey Anthony. I mean, come on. We all know she did it, but uh, the problem was they couldn't prove it uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And so they're trying to, to find ways to uh, prove that she did it. And again, the men are really screwing it up because they're men, and that's one of the major points of, of the play. So I'm going to go through, really, because I think nobody really has any problem. That's My point was when I inter introduced it and said all of those different things about this, the reason I brought that up was because this is one of the few works that we do that I actually like, and students tend to like, um, that... Uh, the worst I do teaching, and I don't know if I do a good job or not, so we don't know about that one. But the more students and I pick up on things quickly, the less I like it. I find that students and I actually pick up on what's going on here uh, pretty quickly. The symbols are pretty clear, but it, it never seems insulting, like goodwill hunting. Uh, it just seems insulting to me as a, as a, a viewer or a reader or whatever. So let's, let's move through that. Again, Mr. Uh, I'm cheating and looking at the names. Mr. Hale, Lewis Hale. We've got the uh, sheriff, uh, Henry Peters, uh, Mrs. Peters, his wife, uh, George Henderson, who's the county attorney, Lewis Hale, who's the neighbor slash witness, Mrs. Peters, who is his wife. Uh, then you've got the characters who aren't in the play, John Wright, who's the dead guy, and Mrs. Wright, who we assume murdered him. Uh, so we start with Mr. Uh, I'm cheating again. Mr. Hale, the neighbor, uh, coming in and retelling to the county attorney what happened and what, what, you know, when he came in. And again, he walks in and Mrs. Wright is in her chair like nothing sort of happened. And, you know, why can't I see him, he said. You know, all of that sort of uh, country language we go through, which is interesting because it was written in Provincetown, I assume set there, uh, makes it interesting there. But anyway, the, the point is, she, she says a line very early on that I really like, and it's not really a symbol, it's more of a, a double meaning, an irony, actually it would be what we would call verbal irony, which is when uh, something has a dual meaning, what's on the surface and what's not, and Mr. Uh, uh, 
Hale asks how she could be in bed with him and not hear this go on. And she says, I sleep sound. Now, again, the reason that is verbal irony is because of the dual meaning. On one hand, you know, what she means on the surface is she's a heavy sleeper. Trust me, I understand that. Uh, I'm a really heavy sleeper. On the other hand, she says, I sleep sound, basically like saying she's not having trouble sleeping at night, even though she's killed her husband. So that's a perfect example of verbal irony. Uh, the, and so we get that pretty early on. Now, again, what you'll notice is the men are focusing on the, the details that aren't going to bring them clues. That's where this title really comes from, right? Trifles or insignificant things. And it's in those insignificant things that we find the clues. And that's not where, you know, while the men are kind of laughing at these women who are worried about these trifles, they're the ones who've discovered how they could convict uh, Mrs. Wright, uh, while the men who are worried about more ser or serious uh, things uh, can't figure it out. So the, the first place, of course, they head is the kitchen, and they, they you know, know that they can't find anything there, so there must not you know, be anything there, because if a woman did it, there would have to be clues uh, somewhere in the kitchen. Now that brings us to our first major symbol, and when it comes to this play, it really is all about the symbols, and I think y'all y'all picked up on those pretty quickly. The first one being the the canned goods. Um, again, what is a canned good? We're well, not canned jarred here. And and she's worried, you know, she, they don't, the women don't want to tell her that the, her fruit that she had preserved has frozen and the, the jars have, have, you know, uh, broken. And, you know, that's again a trifle to the men, but what that's sort of symbolic of is, we see this throughout the entire play, is of Mrs. Wright because she is sort of a, a fresh fruit that's been picked and, and shoved into this jar, right? So, you know, it's still a strawberry in there, but it's, or cherry soup is one of the things that uh, survived, but that is sort of trapped in this jar. And th th last night, or the night before the play was set, those jars exploded. And that's when we see uh, Mrs. Wright explode and break out of her jar. So I think that's an, an interesting um, symbol. Uh, of course, the apron plays that role too, where she's in jail, but she wants her apron, and even the women can't understand uh, why she would want her apron. And again, that's because really all she can she has to hold on to is that that sense of domesticity, that sense of being a, a housewife. Uh, you know, and again, one of the things too, which we'll get to later, with why do Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Hale handle the things the way they do? Again, there are all of these insults sort of flying at the men about how dirty this house is, about all of those other, you know, kind of things, and about what a horrible housekeeper she must have been. It's clear that they don't understand what really goes into that that level of work. Another symbol here is, again, the men saying, you know, she's quilting. And the men saying that the quilt, worried about if she's going to knot it or, or um, uh, stitch it, is th this concern. And, you know, why are women worried about something as, as, as trifling as a quilt? And if you think about it, that's a great symbol there because it's something that these men do not see as important at all. And especially at the time that this was written, I mean, quilts are imperative to daily life. I mean, imagine if, you know, your house were without blanket, uh, blankets and anything to sleep under. And so, again, the quilt is something we don't really see. Most people don't look at as imperative, but it's absolutely imperative for survival. And so, or at least comfort. Uh, and so, but in a house that cold, possibly survival. So... Again, another trifle for the men that turns into a, a huge um, thing. Now, the, the great part about this nodding is the idea, it, it's, it's one of uh, uh, clues that the men are clearly missing. You know, they, don't, they can't find a gun. Why would anybody do this complicated um, way of killing uh, someone, right? The way he's, he's sort of very, he's strangled in his own bed in this really sort of complicated uh, set up where you know he's choked by a rope and all of these complicated knots and and all of the rest of that stuff and that that you know those things are very very difficult to do and that's clearly where this nodding idea on the quilt is they know what good work 
she does and in, in, in how talented she is at this. Now we do see a, sorry bug, we do see a difference in, in as they, they, they note that as, um, and I cannot remember if it's Mrs. Hale or Mrs. Peters, one of the two has to fix her, I'm pretty sure it's Mrs. Peters, feels that she needs to fix the stitching because it's not up to par and she can't stand that. And that's clearly, again, probably from when she was upset at what, what had happened or possibly because an event was going on at the house that drove her to that. You know, there, there, there's, you know, again, it could have, he could have exploded the night before. We don't really get, we know that he's sort of a horrible husband. And we'll, we'll hit on that a little bit later when we get to the big symbol in this. But there is the, the broken door. And, you know, that would be sort of symbolic of, I think, or not symbolic, indicator of domestic violence, you know, kicking down a door to get to her or something of, of, of that, that uh, matter. Now, the biggest single symbol in here, and really the focal point when the two women decide to hide it, is this canary, right? The canary on the surface is what led her you know it was the one thing that she had he, we noticed early on he won't allow her to have a party line uh which you can read the definition of that in your vocabulary list what the, what that is but he doesn't want a phone because people talk too much and you know so again you know you can tell he's not a chatty man he's not the kind of guy who's going to come home and discuss the day with his wife we assume he's told her on multiple occasions she probably needs to shut up and so so he's back to that that canary uh, he you know has broken this canary's neck which is on the surface the one sort of thing that she has and he 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 wrung its neck and how does she get back again there's another clue there by tying a rope around his neck and and killing it him using his neck just as she used uh he did with canary uh, the other thing too is canary is and it's actually listed in your vocabulary words, and I know you all know what a canary is, but a canary is a very, I don't want to say complex, more so than just, hmm, complicated or just large, I want to say large symbol. You know, it symbolizes a lot of, of different things. Again, it symbols, you know, sweetness and delight and gleefulness and singing and colorful and all of those other things. And then you've got that complicated idea that it's, that it's caged. And so it can symbolize, you know, all of those things. And it, but, you know, it can also be symbolized all of those things being caged. And we know before Mrs. Wright was outgoing, she sang, she used to wear pretty dresses, you know, bright like a canary, out into the town. And after she married, you know, it's been 30 years uh, of her sort of not being seen or talked to by anybody because she's being caged, metaphorically, by her, her husband who, you know, if not physically abusive, is sort of indirectly abusive in, in, in some other way, whether that be verbally or just, you know, in, in, that he's a tyrant and won't let her uh, do what she wants. The other symbol, too, I think that's interesting with the canary is canaries were very often symbolized, not very often, but can sometimes symbolize a death. And think about um, what we used canaries for. We used to take canaries in coal mines, in cages, uh, into coal mines with us to see if there was enough oxygen because a canary would die from lack of oxygen much more quickly than a human being would. And so, again, it, it's, it's a very complicated symbol from something that means sort of happiness and life and singing and joyfulness all the way to something that symbolizes entrapment and, and possibly death. And so, again, that's the, that really overarching symbol. Now... Why do the women hide the clues, okay? The nodding, the canary that they clearly hide, uh, you know, all of this other stuff. And again, the, the answer's clear there. The women are, are um, being insulted consistently by the men in, the, in this situation. You know, Mrs. Peters is, you know, again, almost, she's objectified as almost an extension of her husband. You know, she's uh, because she's married to a man of the law, then therefore she must, you know, live by the law. And by not doing so, she's really breaking free and rejecting this idea that she's some sort of, you know, 
appendage of her husband and his 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 career. And so, you know, it's it's a pretty straightforward uh, sort of thing. And that's where you know, again, the title, a jury of of, of what was the original title, as I said, a jury of her peers. You know, again, this is who who ultimately decides. You know, in jury duty, women. Uh, I should have googled that. Women. What you could do? When were did, were women given the right? It may have been as part of uh, around the same time. I'm sure the right to serve on juries. It may have come later. Um, may have come earlier. I really should have looked that up. But I'll post it with this video. What the answer to that is. But the point is. This, these actually are her peers. You know, we, we see that a lot in court cases where you have, uh, you know, an African American defendant and an all white jury, which is a problem. Uh, you know, you've got all, all of this, this, this idea of your peers not actually being the ones who are judging you, even though it's other people, that doesn't necessarily make them your peers. And so, who are the peers here who are judging her ultimately are the, the other women. And while they, know she's guilty of the murder, they sort of find it as possibly self-defense or it, it certainly excusable in that she, what she had gone through. And so they ultimately are the ones who decide, you know, we can assume from the ending of this that she's not going to ever be tried and or convicted uh, because of these women's actions. So, uh, an interesting story. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm sure I've missed something. And like I said, I will get up on that date on uh, women serving on juries as soon as I get off of here because I feel like a complete idiot that I didn't know that. And anyway.